where does the Baptist church flow from? The Baptist church flows from the Bible, folks. It, it is taken as close as you can to what the Bible says about what a church should be. Now, now the next thing, the little paper I handed out to you a little while ago, is an acronym. This isn't my acronym. It's kind of a comparison of, of other acronyms I've seen. But it gives an idea of who we are. Because, folks, if you don't know who you are, you won't know how to tell anybody else who you are, right? And I wouldn't want to be a church that, that didn't have a sign out there that, that told what we were. Now, I went to one church one time, and they said that they were the first church of the independent, fundamental, pre-tribulational, uh, KJV, uh, I mean, they told everything on the front side, and I lost in the whole thing of what was going on, you know. But we do have, we have an idea of who we are, I think, by that Baptist heritage that we have. So, so as we look at this here, the first thing I want you to see about a Baptist is, Baptists desire to be about the Bible. They desire to bring it the sole authority for their faith and practice to come from the Bible. Now, there, you won't find many different Christian denominations that don't say this, but you will find differences. For example, uh, the Methodist Church. I'm not trying to be bad at the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church believed that a woman can serve as a pastor. And what did I talk about this morning? A woman cannot serve as a pastor. What from? The Bible. So when you say, I'm just going on the Bible, and then you have this going on, it ain't the Bible, is it? Right? Am I right? Is that not like logical sense? So... With the Baptists, at least from, from historically, what we have tried to do is to stay to what the Word of God says. And we don't add to it. Many different denominations, Catholic, Orthodox, different groups, they'll add in tradition. They'll add in the saints. They'll add in all these different things. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17 says this, But continue thou, Paul talking to Timothy, he says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. That is where the, everything should come from, from the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. So when Paul, Paul was this church planner, he was talking to this young man coming up to faith, it was helping him start churches. And when he told him, when you want to start a church, how does it begin? It begins by what you learn from the Bible. And that alone, it has to start from the Holy Scriptures. Why? Well, the next verse says it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. If I'm not telling you what the Word of God says, you put more trust in this. I'll just tell you that. You put trust in what the Word of God says. That's what our authority has to be. Because it's under inspiration, absolute inspiration of God. And it's profitable. That means it's worth something for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. You've got to have the Word of God. And that's where it has to start. It doesn't start with Mary, or as Jesus would have said, and you might want to write this scripture down in Luke 11, 27-28, there was this incident where Mary was trying to come and, and come see Jesus. And he was preaching and he was teaching. And it came to pass in Luke 11, 27 through 28, it says, It came to pass as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. Who's he talking about? Mary. Blessed is she. What does Jesus say? But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it that hear the Word of God and keep it. If Mary shows up to you, she says to start a church. She says to do it her way. No. Blessed is they that keep the Word of God. That's how you know what the truth is only from the Word of God. Other people will say, well, it's through our traditions. Now, let's not, get, let's not get too rough. There's lots of traditions in the Baptist church, aren't they? Traditions that aren't necessarily biblical at times, but they've grown up in there. They help us to grow. They show us different things. Well, there was a time when the Pharisees come to Jesus in Matthew 15, 1 through 9. Uh, Jesus, uh, they came to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem. And they said, why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. 
I'm going to get rid of him for not washing his hands. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress what? The commandment of God by your tradition. You see, there are times that churches have put tradition over and above what the Word of God says. And that's what was happening with the Pharisees. They had taken the Old Testament they had, and they put their traditions above that. And Jesus goes on to say, He says, For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, ye say, according to your tradition, Whosoever shall say to his father and mother, It's a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus, so what he had done here, he had taken, they said, well, if you give a gift to the church, the, the temple at that time, well, you can look over honoring father and mother and taking care of them as long as we're getting taken care of by their tradition. And he says, Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, Thy people draw near unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. We've always got to be careful that we don't start teaching the traditions that we've heard over what the Word of God says. The Word of God has to be the sole authority in everything we say and everything we do. And it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to open up the Bible and just go with your rose-colored sunglasses that you have of tradition throughout all your life and look at it through that. You've got to take off those rose-colored sunglasses and take the Word of God for what it says. And then God will reveal truth to you. Then you'll see the truth that's there. What about A here? I'll move right along. A an autonomous or an independent local church. Now, an autonomous or independent local church, it means that this church is its own body. It governs itself. Every Baptist church governs itself. It's its own local church. Even though there's nothing wrong with cooperation, we cooperate with the cooperative program. But David Hawkins down there as the administrator, he's not my pope. He's not the head. No, he works with us. He is what is called the missionary of this area, and he works with us to go send the monies out to all these different missionaries, which I hope you'll be praying about to do with that Lottie Moon Christmas offering next Sunday. All that is done, but each local assembly is to stand before God as an independent entity and is responsible for its own actions. The local church is to call its own pastor. You know, in other denominations and groups, they have somebody call them in. Well, according to the Baptist, and according to what I believe the Word of God says, the local church is to call its own pastor, carry out its own discipline, administrate for that local assembly the statutes of the Word of God, and endeavor to serve the Lord as guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, where do you see that at? Well, Matthew 18, 15 through 17 gives us the idea of how that is to take place. It even says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst. I am there in a small local church carrying out church discipline. Acts 13, 1 through 3, that church itself sent out missionaries. They didn't get along a bunch of, a whole bunch of groups together. That was just that local church. Philippians 4, 15 through 16, it shows to us that that local church would support missions. And I think one of the best things of this, when, when, when Jesus wrote to the churches in book, the book of Revelation, the seven churches, he didn't write to them all together. What did he do? He wrote to each specific local church telling them what they were to do, how they were to act, what that was to be done. So we see this here right off the bat that God dealt with each one of those local churches and they were responsible for what they'd done. They didn't have somebody on high that was sending somebody down to go do these different things. That local church had to make itself. There's a whole lot more on all of this. Maybe one of these days I'll sit down and we'll go through a whole study of all of these. Uh, but I'm just going to quickly go over them tonight. Uh, so we've got the Bible. We've got an autonomous, independent local church. P is for the priesthood of all believers. This is a distinctive Baptist doctrine that each believer is, is a priest unto God. It means that all born-again believers have the privilege of direct access to God. I don't have to go down to the church and go off in a little corner and get inside of a little box and talk to another man to get through to God. I can go directly to God. I have direct access to Him uh, according to what the Scripture says in 1 Peter 2.9. This is just one of many verses. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We don't do like the Old Testament and go meet a priest and go slay a lamb anymore. 
a royal priesthood and holy nation of peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. He has shown you the light and you're welcome to come in, going in boldly to the throne of grace. And that is the idea of the priesthood of all believers. That's why when we have a meeting, we have, we have everybody have a vote in different things. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have different leaders because that's what number uh, rather letter T is about. In the Baptist church, in the local Baptist church, there is the belief that there are two offices. Two offices, and only two. Uh, a pastor, we talked about the qualifications for a pastor today in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, uh, Titus 1, 5 through 9, and a deacon. Uh, there's qualifications for a deacon. You don't see anything in the Bible about a pope. You don't see anything in the Bible about archbishops. You don't see anything such as that. All you see is the local church having these two offices of a pastor and a deacon. And that's why I'm so glad. I want to just take this moment to say I'm so glad for our deacon who has stepped up to serve here. And we should all be very proud of him and thank him. I'm just very thankful we have a deacon. I'm very thankful we have a deacon. And so, so there is a very, these are two offices that are, are, are being put in place. So that's, that's your T there. Also, I, in a Baptist church, and this is a very hard doctrine I'm going to tell you about, that is very Baptist distinctive, is that there is an individual responsibility. There is an idea that there is a soul liberty. And it's very easy to get this idea confused. I'm going to try to explain it as best as I can. It's not that there is no need for there to be t teachers in the church. But God has certainly placed, uh, and God has certainly placed those in the church. We talked about in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. Just talked about the two offices. The pastor is supposed to be the teacher. However, God ultimately imparts truth to the heart of each individual, and that person is responsible as well as accountable for that truth. The idea here is that when we come together, I stand up here, I share the Word of God with you, I teach it to you, and I am trying to convince you of it. I am not compelling you to do it. I am not going to go through and beat you if you do not uh, agree with me exactly on how revelation works out. I'm, you have the uh, authority in your heart you know, by what God has revealed to you right now as you grow and you take things in. And so the idea here is, coming from back from history, there were many times where people would come in and if you didn't agree with my Christian belief, what would they do? What they do then first Baptist? I've told you about that before. You like being baptized? All right, stay down there a little while longer until you don't breathe anymore, you know? So we believe that people have the right to believe. But here's the, here's the, here's the rub on that. Here's the rub on that. It's not the idea, well, well, you know, I think it's okay to have sex outside of a marriage now. You know, that's just what I believe. No, that's not how this works. You see, there's a rub about this idea that you have an individual responsibility for God. It allows for differing points of view. Maybe you have a different point of view. You know, we can, we can slightly go along. When somebody tries to rigidly push their certain agenda on somebody, it can get rough. You know what I'm saying? Because there are different people in this congregation who are different levels of spirituality. You hear what I'm saying? There's things that they can't quite take yet. And we see that throughout the Scripture. It talks about not breaking a man's conscience. Remember when I preached about that, about not breaking a man's conscience? About something? There might be something that's not bad to somebody else that is, it, it would be bad to that person. It might be, as the Scripture talks about, there were people who sacrificed to idols and they were buying this meat real cheap. So they'd come and they'd get the meat and they would go buy it. And if somebody within the church seen you going down there buying this meat that was sacrificed to idols, somebody had just come out of that would be so tore up to imagine that they had done such a thing. So there is this idea that there's this individual conscience, not from what the Baptist distinctives are, but from what the Bible says. But there's this danger, I want you to be aware of that, there's this danger of misinterpreting what that means. Maybe one day we'll look closer at that. Here's one verse that gives you an idea of this believer's responsibility. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, everybody, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, individually, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You have been given knowledge. You've got to deal with it. Now, now, that doesn't shirk the pastor's responsibility, though. In, in Hebrews 13, 17, it says that, uh, talking about pastors, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, that they're, they're in charge of as, as a pastor, and submit yourselves, 
For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So the idea here is that as a pastor, I am responsible for myself, but as I stand here and I preach and I teach the Word of God to you and I, take, I try to go visit and I try to do these different things, I have that responsibility for your souls on me. I ha- I, that's what's so dangerous about my job, I'll be honest with you. When I stand and I teach the Word of God, I, I want to make sure I get right. Sometimes people don't always hear it right, though. It says, not let many of you be masters, for of such is a stricter judgment. Why, wow, there's so many words coming out of our mouths. People hear it in so many different ways. And you know, you don't want to be somebody that you want to get out as clear as possible as you can. So, so there's that idea here of this individual responsibility. But not only that, this might surprise you as a Baptist distinctive, there is a separation of church and state. A separation of church and state. The, the Baptists believe that civil governments are to be respected in all temporal matters they should be. Uh, that's not contrary to conscience and the Word of God. And they're to be obeyed, but, but they have no authority. The government has no authority in spiritual concerns. They have no right to speak to or have control or interfere with matters of religion, uh, but are bound to protect all good citizens in the peaceable enjoyment of their religious rights and privileges. Now, throughout history, that idea has been challenged. What do we see over and over again? That there will be these Christian groups, and they'll come in, and they'll almost take over a state. The Pope, he owned his own, he's got his own area over there, right? And he had this rule over all the kings at one time. Uh, the next time we get around to it, we'll talk about uh, different areas where churches would come in, different denominations, and when they converted over, that whole state became part of that church. And it made a difference. So there was this state church that took place. Baptists have always been against that. Why? Because we believe the Scripture teaches that. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one, Jesus speaking, He said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. If Jesus makes a distinction between the state and the church, then so should we, right? He says, render unto them this, take care of that, and render unto God the things that are God's. Romans 13, 1 also tells us this, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever's been put in, whether you like him or not, God put him there, okay? You may think we all voted him in, but God put him there. He did, no matter what person that would be. And the church is supposed to be not controlling the nation, but to work as the conscience of the nation. We are supposed to boldly speak. When we see wickedness in our country, and our nation, we're supposed to boldly speak out against it, showing where the truth of the Word of God is, holding it up to those leaders who are above us. But we are never supposed to be in charge of the, the government itself. That's not our place. There will be a time. There will be a time in the millennial kingdom. Then the church will rule with Christ, but not today. Not today. Not only is there a separation of church and state, but there's also two ordinances. Two ordinances that the Baptist church sees. One is believer's baptism by immersion. And I think that's very clear throughout the Scripture. Um, You will never, ever see a baby being baptized in in the Bible. Never. Not one place will you see that occur. In Acts 8, 36-37, we see the idea of believer's baptism. And it says here, uh, And as they went on their way, there came into certain water, and this was the eunuch and, and uh, Philip together, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What did Philip say? What has to come before you're baptized? He said, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, therefore now it's time to get baptized. Why did Scott get baptized twice? Because he wanted to make sure he got in the right order. I did. I wanted to make sure it was in the right order because baptism comes after salvation. That's how it works, folks. If not, you're just getting wet. You just had a little fun in the water. Salvation has to occur first. It has to occur first. And even in that passage, it goes a little deeper in verse 39. It says, They went down into the water. And it says in verse 39, they come up out of the water. When you hear about the Scripture talking, like I said, that word baptismo means to immerse. 
The only reason that the King James translators translated that out as baptized is because King James believed in infant baptism and they would have been dead if they had translated that word into English as immerse. So, this idea of believer's baptism, two ordinances. What's the other one? Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. Luke twenty-two nineteen tells us how that should be administered. He says, in Jesus saying, and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it unto them. Remember, they went breaking of bread. Isn't that what it said? And saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. He didn't say, you're doing this for salvation. What did he say you were doing it for? To remember my death until I come. That's what this was for. It's not that the, the, the church holds it back from... Do you know that one of the great kings, when, when, when popery first started, one of the great kings, he come and bowed his head because the Pope said he wouldn't give him communion anymore and he thought he was going to hell because of it. And so he'd grow power from them that way. And he took control over these kings and stuff when he would withhold the body and the bread because they thought they were in danger. But the Scripture, that's not what Jesus said, is it? I don't care what a pope says. I don't care what any man says. All that matters is like what that first Baptist distinctive was. What? The Bible is the authority. The Bible is the authority. So there are these two ordinances. And finally, S. S. What could S stand for? S is the most precious one, I believe. It stands for salvation. Salvation. It all comes down to this point. You see, all of this stuff gets mixed up down through the centuries. People are so confused, they don't know what's going on. And if they had just opened up their Bibles to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it very clearly tells us what's, what salvation is. I remember it so well, I was riding down the road, I said, Daddy, what is salvation? And he quoted these verses. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. There's nothing you can do to earn that salvation. There's nothing you can do to keep that salvation. That salvation is yours. It doesn't matter how many times you take communion. It doesn't matter how many times you get wet. It doesn't matter how many good deeds you do. It doesn't matter how many kind people you go and shake their hand. It doesn't matter how many times you come to church. It doesn't matter how many times you work in a Christmas player. How many times you work out in the drive through nativity. It doesn't matter all of these different things. It doesn't matter if you have it checked off over and over and over again. I've done this body by Bible reading. I know the Bible inside and out. It does not matter whatsoever unless you have received grace through faith. Through faith. By grace. I was walking along one day and he, he spoke to me. He said, come. And I scared. But then I received it through faith. I took his hand. I received it. Now, when somebody gives you a gift, do you have to earn anything to get a gift? Not one thing. You don't earn it. When you've got Christmas gifts and you're having to pay for your own Christmas gifts, when you get to be the adult in the, in the family, it gets kind of sad on you to buy your gifts, don't it? Yeah, it gets kind of sad because you're buying your own gift then, right? When your husband and wife's going back and forth, you're buying your own gift. But a real gift, a true gift, is something that is being given to you and you just receive that gift. You take it. You take it. It's so simple. It's so simple. But I tell you what, people have added things to it all down throughout time. They've added all these different things. And even to make it even more clear, he says there, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Now listen now, listen now. It isn't like though you receive that gift and nothing happens. What did we say in the beginning? You are a new creature in Christ. You know why, you say, Scott, we hear this all the time, over and over again, all the time. You know why I say this over all, over all the time? So you'll remember it, because it's important. It's the gospel. It's the gospel, for we are His workmanship. God working through you, creating Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This, the Baptist belief here is that if, when you've been saved, you'll be different than you were before. You'll be a different person. God has changed you. That doesn't mean that you are like the old Wonder Woman TV show. She did a little flip and all of a sudden she was in her Wonder Woman outfit, right? Am I telling my age there or what? Uh, yeah, she did a little flip and she changed it completely. No, you'll see a change in that person. And sometimes it grows. It grows over time. 
Some people start adding things back to it. They'll think, well, I have to go, I have to do all these different things. And they'll get all mixed up in their mind. Baptist churches a lot of times have done that, folks. They get things mapped up in their mind. Well, if I don't show up dressed a certain way, then I'm not saved. And then another guy will come along. Well, let me tell you, you're not saved because you're dressed a certain way. Can I tell you what? They all had on a skirt back then, didn't they? Right? Your clothing... You'll want to dress in such a way as not to show yourself off. That's all the Scripture says. That's what we said this morning, wasn't it? But if you will just take, just take this simple Word of God and you say, God, I'm going to listen to what this says. What thus saith the Lord. And I'm going to build on what you have given me in this church based on that. I'm going to build on myself what you have said based on that then I'm going to grow into what Christ wants me to be. And I believe that if you follow these distinctives that I've showed here throughout, that you'll have what the Bible said was the local church back then. I really do. That's what I believe. And I believe it seems pretty clear from what the Word of God says. So, I'm going to give us a moment. Because we've looked at some things about the gospel tonight. Maybe there's somebody here, and maybe we'll just sing and we'll praise God. Dave, let's, let's have a song if you don't mind. Maybe we'll just sing and praise God, but maybe there's something you want to pray about. Maybe there's some things that you put on your tradition to hold you down and make you into something less than what God wants you to be. I'm, before anything else, I want you to know this. I believe in what the Baptists are, but before anything else, I'm a Christian in God's church. That is what is most important, that we are a Christian in God's church. Do you hear me? And if there be anybody they don't know Him as Savior and Lord, I pray you'll take that opportunity to do that right now. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's pray. If you need to speak with someone about what was discussed in this sermon, you can find our phone number at our church's Facebook page. Or we would love for you to come meet us at one of our regular meetings in person. Sunrise is located directly off Exit 23 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. We regularly meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for small group Bible studies and then at 10.50 a.m. for worship. We also meet Sunday evenings for worship at 6.30 p.m. and Wednesday nights for discipleship training at 6.30 p.m. We would love for your family to meet our family. And again, thank you for watching and sharing with others.